Well, hello, my friends, and welcome once again to Declaring Liberty. So here's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, there has been some new information uncovered by the January 6th committee that I want to discuss. But before I get to that, there's something else I want to spend some time talking about. And before I tell you what that is, let me set the stage a little bit so that you understand where I'm coming from in all of this. You know, I, there's a lot of you out there who've been following me for a long time. You've been listening to this podcast uh, perhaps for years. And there was a point in time where I probably had very few, if any, liberal listeners or Democrat members of this audience. And, you know, that's unfortunate. But thankfully, things are changing, and I have a lot more people who come from the left side of the aisle listening to this podcast and following my, um, you know, watching my videos on YouTube. And I am very grateful for that. And it's something that I want more of. Not because I've necessarily changed uh, my positions on things, but I have certainly changed my approach to politics. Um, I believe that one of the worst aspects, most destructive aspects of our politics is the partisan nature of it. I think parties, the political parties, are incredibly detrimental to this country. You know, in the past there have been people who have warned against parties. George Washington famously warned this country against partisan politics and allegiance to party because he knew that it would lead to exactly the kind of poisoned political atmosphere that we experience here today. And I must admit that I myself was part of the problem, giving in to partisan politics, taking part in the tribal nature of politics, the us versus them, my side versus their side. And, you know, um, I am sure that my commentary and my approach was colored by that in the past. And I am doing my absolute best to keep away from that kind of, of politics going forward in the future. I don't want anything to do ever again with tribal politics. And the reason I say all this is just so that you understand how I have evolved in my approach to all of this. Now that all said, I know that I have angered a lot of Republicans and people who consider themselves conservatives. Now, I will tell you that many people, and perhaps some of you in this audience, who consider themselves conservatives are not conservatives. Um, that discussion for another day. But I know that, that a lot of people on the right have been angry with me of late because I have been critical of Republicans, especially Donald Trump, and that has made a lot of people angry. Um, but today, I think I may make some people on the left a little bit angry with my commentary. Now, that is not my intent, and I am hoping that people keep an open mind about what I'm going to say and hear me out. Um, I want to appeal to people who are open-minded. Yes, you may be a member of one party or the other. But the problem is that too many people approach politics, and, and again, I'm not in a, innocent of this myself, but they approach politics in a tribal nature. So if they hear any criticism of their side or of some pet issue of theirs, they reflexively get angry and they defend their side, and they attack the other side. Both sides do this. I reject all of that. We should be able to reason together. We should be able to express our opinions on things and not immediately 
uh, go on the offense or go on the defense, uh, reflexively attack or reflexively defend our side. Why can't we just put the damn tribal politics aside and just talk about the issue? That's the problem with tribal politics. It prevents people from actually talking about the damn issues. So, what I want to talk about today is the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill. And I'll begin with a tweet from Republican Senator Tim Scott, a guy who has clearly been making moves to run for president. Now, I don't know if he's going to run for president, but he's obviously has it on his mind. He has made trips up to New Hampshire. He's done all the typical things. I mean, there's no reason for a senator from South Carolina to go up and and give speeches to political groups in New Hampshire unless you're considering running for president. Okay, so Tim Scott is obviously considering running for president. And here's a tweet he put out yesterday um, commemorating the passage and the, the, well, the, the, the signing by President Biden of the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill. He wrote this, after four years of hard work, my Emmett Till anti-lynching bill is finally law. I'm proud to have played a part in passing this historic bill and making clear that we should never tolerate violence and hatred spread by those with evil in their hearts. Okay, now, this is supposedly a conservative, supposedly a guy who is faithful to the Constitution. Now, he's, he sponsored this bill in the Senate, co-sponsored it with Cory Booker, Democrat from New Jersey. Now, here's my problem. I, I will tell you that, you know, I oppose this bill, and I will explain to you why. It's not because I support lynching. If... Um, if anybody and I and I concur with the sentiment expressed by Tim Scott in this tweet. Well, I largely concur. You know, he says that uh, this bill is against those. Uh, we, we, we should never tolerate violence and hatred spread by those with evil in their hearts. You know, I agree with that to an extent. Um, part of that I, I don't agree with if you're saying that we are going to criminalize those who have hatred in their hearts or punish hatred. You can't punish hatred, right? You can, you can punish the expression of that hatred if it results in a crime, but, you know, you can't, someone has hatred in their heart and they hate people, you can't punish them based on that. But anyways, don't want to get off in that philosophical tangent. Anyway, here's the thing. Anyone or any group of people who lynches someone, in my view, should be arrested and prosecuted and sentenced, once convicted, uh, as harshly as the law will allow. Okay? Okay. My problem with this bill is that you didn't need this bill to do that. Well, I have a couple problems with this bill, and I'm going to take them both in turn. Number one, this bill is legally meaningless. It's, it's redundant and meaningless. It's really just symbolic. It's just political theater and grandstanding. The second problem I have with this, and the more important problem I have with this, really, when you get down to it, is that it's unconstitutional, and I will explain why. Let's begin with why it's meaningless. It's meaningless because it's making it a crime to murder someone by lynching. The problem with that, the reason why it's meaningless, is because murder is already illegal. Okay? Lynching someone to death is already illegal. It's murder. We didn't need to pass another bill to make it illegal. What is it, even more illegal now? I mean, you can't get much more illegal than murder. And you can't really have a punishment that's, you know, a crime that's punished more severely than murder. So this is really just meaningless. Well, perhaps not meaningless. It is redundant. All right? What it essentially does is it takes what is a state crime, murder, and now federalizes it. 
If you murder someone by lynching, it's now a federal crime. Whereas murder is largely just a state crime. But now, now, so prosecutors can bring two different cases against someone who murders someone by lynching. The state crime of murder, and then the federal crime of lynching. So, you know, almost always what would happen is the state would proceed first. They'd get a conviction on this guy for murder. And then while his ass is already sitting in prison, the feds will come in and file lynching charges against him and then give him more time in prison, which, you know, is essentially meaningless. It's redundant. He's already in prison, so you're just going to give him more years that run concurrently. You know, and, and they can't run consecutively because you had state leveling charges and then, you know, doling out a sentence and then you have the feds doling out a sentence. The feds are going to, it's going to have to run concurrent with the state. Char- so there's going to be serving time on both of them at the same time. Anyways, it's just, it's just essentially meaningless because it's redundant. This is just political posturing. I mean, you know, it, I guess murder is just really, really illegal now if you lynch someone. Now, here is the more important reason why I oppose this. This is the more substantive reason why I oppose this bill. And that is that it's unconstitutional. And let me explain. The reason why it's unconstitutional is because the federal government does not have any authority to pass this law. Now, the way the federal constitution works is the federal government is supposed to be one of limited enumerated power. That means that the constitution sets up a system where the federal government only has that authority which is specifically given to it by the Constitution. So anything that the federal government wants to do, any law that Congress seeks to pass, must be authorized by the Constitution. They must tie that. If they're going to pass a law, they must be able to cite that section of the Constitution which gives them the authority to pass that law. The problem here is that the Constitution gives Congress no authority whatsoever to pass this kind of law. Go to Article 1 of the Constitution, which which lays out the authority of Congress, and you will find nothing in there that grants Congress the authority to pass this kind of law. Now, a lot of people, because our civics education in this country is so pathetic and lacking. A lot of people believe that the federal government has the authority to do anything it wants unless the Constitution specifically says that it can't. Well, that's absolutely backwards. That's the exact opposite of how the Constitution actually works. The federal government, instead of the federal government be a, being able to do whatever it wants unless the Constitution says no. In reality, how it, how it works is the federal government cannot do something unless the Constitution specifically says that it can. So anytime, the, this, this is Constitutional Law Interpretation 101. If you are evaluating whether an act by the federal government in this case Congress, is legal or not, you take a look at it, and then you have to be able to trace the authority for that act back to the Constitution. Okay? So, again, do this on your own. The authority of Congress is laid out in Article 1. Take a look at it. Go through it with a fine-tooth comb. See if you can find anything that gives Congress the authority to pass this kind of law, and you will find none. You will find none. The way that Congress... I mean... Here's, here's the truth, and we'll talk about this more another time. We've gotten into this before. We'll, we'll, we'll do it again. The truth of the matter is that much of what the federal government today does is unconstitutional under the Constitution as, as written. The problem is the Supreme Court has expanded 
the meaning of the Constitution beyond the written word of the Constitution. In fact, they've essentially amended the Constitution illegally because the Supreme Court does not have authority to amend the Constitution, to change the meaning of the Constitution, to insert words or remove words from the Constitution. Um, you have to follow the amendment process to amend the Constitution. And the Supreme Court has no role in the constitutional amendment process. Yet, in ruling on cases over the years, the Supreme Court has essentially, functionally, amended the Constitution. And so, the single greatest way, um, the, the single biggest, greatest means by which the Constitution has been interpreted to expand, really illegally, expand the authority of the federal government is through the Commerce Clause. Okay, because the, the Commerce Clause, the Constitution in Article 1, says that Congress shall have authority to regulate interstate commerce. So it must be actually interstate commerce in order for Congress to regulate it, to pass a law regulating it. The Supreme Court, in a case called Wickard versus Filburn, and, and I won't get too far off into the weeds on this, took up a case and essentially amended the Commerce Clause to read that Congress has authority to regulate anything affecting interstate commerce. They essentially amended the Commerce Clause by inserting the word affecting into the Commerce Clause, which greatly expanded the scope of the Commerce Clause. The Constitution requires that it has to be, in fact, commerce in order to interstate commerce in order to be regulated by Congress. The Supreme Court changed that to say that it just has to affect interstate commerce. So you could make the argument that virtually anything has some sort of effect on interstate commerce. And that, over the years, since the 1940s, when that case was handed down, that is what the federal government has done. Congress has passed laws they have absolutely no authority to pass. And then the Supreme Court has upheld those laws, saying that, yeah, well, those things aren't really interstate commerce. Taken as a whole in the aggregate, blah, 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 it has some perceivable or theoretical effect on interstate commerce. And therefore, we will, we will say that it's constitutional, that Congress has the authority to do that. When, in fact, really under the Constitution, it doesn't have any authority to do that. Now, usually, when Congress passes laws like this Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, uh, they claim that it is authorized by the Commerce Clause. Now, I do not know specifically what authority they're claiming to pass this law, but I almost guarantee you they're saying that it is a Commerce... Well, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. But in the past, it has been a Commerce Clause. But what I will tell you for certain is that whatever uh, authority Congress claims they have to pass this law, it's BS. They don't have any such authority. Let, let's, let's change the, the scenario here. Okay? Here they criminalized at the federal level murdering someone by lynching them. What if they had made it a federal crime to murder someone by stabbing them to death with a knife? Would, would Congress have the authority to do that? No! Absolutely, they would have no such authority to do that. If you understand the Constitution, just the basics of the Constitution, you know that almost all police powers in this country reside with the state. The states. The states retain almost exclusive authority um, in the area of criminal law and other policing. Thing. Unless it has to do with federal crimes, which there is, there is really only very few, a very limited subject matter that Congress can deal with by passing criminal laws. It's a very narrow sliver of authority given to uh, the federal government to pass criminal laws, except as it relates to federal property. Now, the Congress here, anti-lynching bill... They can pass this law making it a crime to lynch someone on federal property. They could do that. But that's not what they did here. They made it a, a crime to lynch someone 
and they made it a federal crime to murder someone by lynching anywhere in the country. Now, they have no authority to do that. And if they had passed a law saying that it is a federal crime to murder someone by stabbing them to death anywhere in the country, that would be just laughed out of court because Congress clearly has no authority to do that. So what's the difference? What's the difference? Murdering someone by stabbing them to death or murdering them by lynching them? There is no difference. You're just, you're just criminalizing certain means of committing a murder. By this rationale, the federal government could, you know, just pass murder statutes of any kind they want that are applicable generally across the entire country. Nobody with even the most rudimentary understanding of the Constitution and no court anywhere in this country would rule that Congress has the authority to pass such a law. So why is this any different? Constitutionally, substantively, legally, it is no difference. The difference here is purely political because lynching is was the method famously used by Southern racists who, you know, killed blacks. Okay, so it has a very important historical component to this, a, a, a historically symbolic component to this that goes all the way back to slavery and, and you know, more recently. But it's, it's race and slavery and all of that dis racial discrimination. It's all wrapped up in lynching. But that does not, the historical nature of this and its connections to slavery and, and to racial discrimination throughout our history, that does not magically imbue lynching with some sort of substantive federal connection. It doesn't change the constitutional analysis in any way. Just because it may be a sensitive topic um, racially. You know, and maybe stabbing by knife doesn't have the, the racial, the historic racial connotation that lynching does. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change the constitutional analysis. It doesn't somehow magically make this a federal issue. It does not. It simply doesn't. And because it doesn't, the federal government doesn't have any damn authority to pass this kind of law. But it gives politicians an opportunity to grandstand and to show all the world that they're against slavery and racial discrimination and murder and people who have hatred in their heart or whatever the hell Tim Scott said here. And you know who, who you know, which politicians specifically are in today's political scene are, are so eager to sign on and to vote for this kind of thing. It's Republicans. And, you know, in the Senate, all Republicans join in this. And this passed unanimously in the Senate. Well, why would Republicans, supposedly, you know, supposedly these great defenders of the Constitution, get aboard and pass a law that clearly they don't have authority under the Constitution to pass? Well, it's because, you know, they, they don't want to be accused of being racist. So they want to, you know, they're falling all over each other, praising this bill, like Tim Scott here, friggin', you know, co-sponsoring it. Because they don't want to be accused of being racist. They want to show everybody, hey, they're against lynching too. Uh, so it's, it's pure political theater. Now, will this law ever be struck down by the courts? Uh, almost certainly not. For a couple of reasons. Number one, this bill may never even be reviewed by the Supreme Court. Because contrary to what a lot of idiots out there seem to think laws passed by Congress aren't automatically reviewed by the Supreme Court. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've had people, you know, when I say some law is unconstitutional, say, oh, well, the Supreme Court will just strike it down. Or, or they'll say, well, yeah, if it's unconstitutional, how come the Supreme Court never struck it down? The Supreme Court can't strike down a law unless a case challenging that law is brought before them. People seem to think that the, the court just automatically reviews any laws passed by Congress that they want or that they review all of them and pass on their constitutionality. No, it doesn't work that way. Laws are on the books unless a case 
is brought against that law, challenging that law, and it makes its way to the Supreme Court, then, then the Supreme Court can rule on that law. So unless a case is brought to challenge this law, the Supreme Court will never hear it. And people can't just challenge it. I can't file, file a lawsuit against Congress challenging the constitutionality of this bill. Only someone with standing can challenge the constitutionality of this bill. And so someone would have to be um, arrested and prosecuted and convicted under this bill. And then, as a way of appealing their conviction, they can file a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of this bill. They'll basically be saying to the court, um, I want my conviction overturned because Congress never had authority to pass this law in the first place. It's an unconstitutional law. You need to, un you need to overturn my conviction. That's the only way this law is going to be challenged. Now, the reason this is likely never to find its way into the courts is because um, nobody gets lynched anymore. Or almost no. I mean, how many times is someone lynched anymore in this country? It, it basically doesn't ever happen. Yes, every once in some great while, some long period of time, someone will be lynched. Okay, so theoretically, yeah, I guess, I guess it's possible that someone could get arrested and prosecuted under this statute. But effectively, it doesn't freaking happen anymore. Okay? So that's number one reason why this may never get to the Supreme Court, because no one's actually going to be prosecuted under this law. Again, it's complete. It's almost completely and utterly symbolic. It's meaningless. And on top of that, it's redundant. Because murder, again, is already illegal. That's number one. The other reason why this will probably never be overturned is because even if, in the extremely unlikely scenario that someone is actually prosecuted federally under this anti-lynching bill, the Supreme Court is not going to throw it out. They, because as I say, the Supreme Court has been part of this massive e expansion of federal power. They are the reason the Supreme Court rubber stamping every act of Congress for the last hundred years or so. Um, has been complicit with the other two branches of government in vastly uh, in, a, in allowing and, and helping the federal government to vastly exceed the scope of its constitutional authority. And so, I mean, when, when does the Supreme Court ever, ever strike down an act of Congress? It almost never, ever, ever does. They f bend over backwards to find any ridiculous justification, however thin, to uphold whatever law is passed by Congress. Look what John Roberts has done in the past. This guy has contorted himself in all different ways in order to uphold clearly unconstitutional laws passed by Congress. Not because they're necessarily bad laws. That's that's debatable whether certain things have been good laws or not, good policy or not. That's not what, what the Supreme Court rules on. The Supreme Court doesn't strike things down or uphold them based upon whether or not they are good policy or not. That That's for Congress to decide. The Supreme Court is there as Justice Roberts said in his confirmation hearing to call balls and strikes in enforcing the Constitution. Either the, the Congress has authority to pass a law or it doesn't have authority to pass a law. Whether that law is a good law or bad law, stupid or smart, is, is irrelevant, or it's supposed to be irrelevant to the Supreme Court, is whether or not it's constitutional or not. And this court, going back, as I say, almost a century now, has done everything they conceivably can do to uphold everything passed by Congress. And I have no doubt that they would do so again if, if a, a lawsuit was brought challenging this law by someone who had been convicted and sentenced under this law. The Supreme Court would uphold it. Uh, they, would, they would buy whatever argument um, is presented by the government lawyers in their briefs to uphold this law. Or they would just make up their own reason to uphold this law, as Chief Justice Roberts has done himself in the past. So, anyway, those are my thoughts on the uh, anti-lynching bill. To recap, number one, it's pointless, it's meaningless, 
Uh, it's not actually going to change anything. I mean, it's not, it's not going to result in someone being prosecuted and sentenced to prison who would not otherwise have been prosecuted and sentenced to prison because murder is already illegal. And so this law changes nothing. All it does is give politicians an opportunity to grandstand, right? And number two, it's unconstitutional. Now, if you disagree with me on any of that, that's fine. What I hope from members of this audience is that you just consider what I have to say. Have an open mind about this stuff. Have an open mind about the substance of issues, not just things that I talk about, but generally speaking. Okay? And if at the end of the day we disagree about things, that's fine. But what I'm so sick of is the tribal politics. And I know that a lot of my friends on the left side of the aisle who, if they hear me say that I oppose the Emmett Till bill, would just go to their tribal partisan corner and just accuse me of supporting slavery or, or some garbage like that instead of actually having a discussion about the issue. As I say, I don't oppose, obviously, prosecuting and punishing to the full extent of the law anyone who would murder someone by lynching. I support that 100%. What I don't support are redundant, meaningless laws passed for no other purpose other than political grandstanding and which, and most importantly, um, violate the Constitution because they are passed by Congress and Congress has no authority to pass such laws. Okay, That is the real important reason to oppose this bill. We should never support the federal government, any branch of the federal government, exercising authority that they do not have. And here, they do not have any, except on federal property. They can clearly pass a law making it a crime, its own separate crime, to lynch someone on federal property. They have authority to do that. But they don't have authority to reach into states and localities and make it a federal crime to lynch someone anywhere in the country. That they do not have the authority to do. Police powers are reserved almost exclusively to the states. This is a state issue. This is not a federal issue. And therein lies my biggest problem with this. Anyway, I think I've belabored this point enough, so let us move on. Second thing I wanted to talk about today was I want to take the opportunity of some new information that we have discovered uh, from the January 6th committee and just make some comments about Merrick Garland, Joe Biden, and any potential criminal investigation of Trump and his co-conspirators. Okay, Now, we just learned that there is this massive seven-hour gap in the phone records turned over by the White House to the National Archives. So, obviously, we have at least two more crimes, almost certainly committed by Donald Trump and other people um, acting on his orders. Now, I don't have evidence of that, but what I have is common sense. Do I have enough to bring a criminal charge against Trump for this? No. Um, but common sense-wise, uh, yes, the only person um, who could have seven hours of phone records just destroyed, which is obviously what happened here. They didn't, they didn't go missing because they were the, the seven hours that included the insurrection itself, okay? This wasn't just some mistake. Ah, I forgot to turn off my phone. Sorry about that. This wasn't just some mistake. This was obviously very intentional. Can I prove that? No, not yet. I, I can't prove it um, based on what we know. But again, common sense here, people. Common sense. This is certainly just the, the, the mere existence of this seven-hour gap in, in the records is enough to open up a criminal investigation of this. All right. So if what common sense would tell you actually happened here and Donald Trump and or others destroyed these phone logs, then we have at least, bare minimum, two more federal crimes. Uh, number one, this would be tampering with evidence. And number two, this would be destruction of governmental records. Those are two separate and distinct 
crimes. And there may be others here, obstruction of justice and other potential crimes, but there's at least these two. Okay, so whoever either destroyed these records, had a part in destroying these records, or ordered the destruction of these records are all, are all guilty of at least these two federal crimes on top of all the other crimes we know were committed in connection with the attempt to um, overthrow the government essentially and, and uh, overturn the election illegally. And then of course the things that actually happened on January 6th. So that's one thing. But this, this question of prosecution and criminal investigation for Trump and his potential co-conspirators and everything surrounding uh, January 6th and all, going all the way back to the election, day, you know, the, the, the day of the election, that's when all of it really started. All the crimes were being committed uh, from election day when it was clear that Donald Trump lost, or at least the very next day when it was clear Donald Trump lost, all the way through January 6th and really continuing because Donald Trump is still attempting to pressure uh, state and local officials to throw out, not that they, not that they can, this guy is, is, is such a clueless embarrassment. He actually thinks that, um, that states can decertify their elections and recall their electoral votes. He actually believes that that's like a thing, like it's possible. It's not possible. It's not legally possible. It's not constitutionally possible. There is no possibility for this. Yet this moron is out there still trying to pressure people to do exactly that. So the crimes are ongoing. Anyway, just this, this whole issue had me thinking about Merrick Garland and the Justice Department and the fact that so far... Nothing has been done to hold any of the, the the real criminals here. I mean, all these low-level stupid thugs who actually attacked the Capitol and all of that, those were just the idiot pawns. These were just the useful idiots of Donald Trump. These were just his cult members uh, who actually did the, you know, the attacking of the Capitol. The real criminals are people like Donald Trump and his co-conspirators who hatched this plan to usurp the Constitution, overthrow the government, and illegally install him as president for another term. Okay, Those are the real criminals. The morons who attack the Capitol are the political pawns. They're the foot soldiers. Okay, The real criminals are Donald Trump and his co-conspirators. And nothing so far has been done by the Department of Justice to hold anyone um, any one of those co-conspirators accountable for anything. And we have absolutely, to this, to this time, up to now, we have absolutely no evidence whatsoever to suggest that a criminal investigation is even being conducted by the Department of Justice. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't. There could be. But if there is, this is the most well-run, in terms of keeping it secret, federal investigation in the history of the country. There have been no leaks. If there is an investigation, there have been zero leaks. Okay? We're talking about Washington. We're talking about the federal government here. To me, it's almost impossible to believe that there have been no leaks that an investigation is ongoing. And also, we haven't seen, you know, you would think if there was a serious investigation going on, there would be a federal grand jury impaneled to hear the evidence. We have seen no reports of people going in and out of the grand jury who might be connected with this. We see no people, you know, no no Trump co-conspirators filing lawsuits um, to, to, you know, quash subpoenas related to this investigation, to prevent them from testifying or handing over information. Nothing. We've seen nothing. So it's hard for me to believe that an investigation is actually ongoing. Uh, but maybe it is. I hope that there is. And maybe it's much easier to keep it secret if you haven't reached the grand jury phase yet. And it could be that an investigation is ongoing, but it's not really in the grand jury yet. And, and, and But keep in mind, federal grand juries are supposed to be conducted in secret. But we would still see people running to court to challenge things happening in the grand jury. And those court challenges would not be secret. Those would be public. Those would be public filings. Those would be public hearings. We would know about those. So it's hard for me to believe that an investigation is actually ongoing at the federal level, but 
Who knows? Now, here's my thought about this. A lot of people, seemingly justifiably, have been criticizing Merrick Garland. And I've done this myself for the apparent lack of investigation here. And the criticisms of Garland may well be justified, but they may not be. Because it may not be Garland who has made the decision not to investigate or prosecute Trump and his co-conspirators. Merrick Garland has a boss, and his name is President Biden. And it may very well be, and I have absolutely no evidence of this, so I'm not saying that this is what happened, but it just could be. And I wouldn't, and I will tell you that I would not be surprised at all if this is what happened. It could be that President Biden himself instructed the Department of Justice not to investigate this. Uh, and he has absolutely the constitutional right to do that, to do that, to to instruct his Department of Justice not to investigate this. And he also has the authority to tell them to investigate it. We like to think, well, I don't like to think. Um, because it goes against the way our Constitution was laid out. But a lot of people seem to think and want to think that the Department of Justice is an independent branch of government, that the president, you know, appoints the attorney general, and then he's just completely hands off and he has no authority to get involved in uh, what the Department of Justice does. Well, that's not the Constitution. Okay, that's not how the Constitution sets it up. The attorney general is answerable to the president just like every other cabinet secretary, okay? The, the, the attorney general has no more independence than the labor secretary does, okay? And the president has just as much right under the Constitution to get involved with what the Justice Department is doing as the president has to get involved in what the Labor Department is doing or any other department of government is doing, okay? Uh, the president can get involved in any of this if he so chooses. Now, you might not agree with that. You might not think that that's how it should be, but that's how it is. Constitutionally speaking, the president has full authority to do that. Now, generally speaking, I don't think it's a good idea for presidents to get involved in, in prosecutorial decisions and all that kind of thing. Um, but certain cases, DOJ is not going to do anything on certain types of cases that are so highly politically charged without getting permission from the White House. There's no way Merrick Garland goes after Trump or his top co-conspirators unless they get the green light from Biden, okay? And so Biden would have to give the green light to this, and he could also give the thumbs down to this, okay? And so it may very well be, don't know that it's the case, but it may very well be that if nothing is happening, at the federal level in terms of investigating Trump and his co-conspirators. It may not be Merrick Garland's fault. His hands may be tied. Now, if that's the case, if Joe Biden told Merrick Garland not to investigate Trump and his co-conspirators or to bring any charges against them if they committed any crimes, which they certainly did, if that's what happened, if Merrick Garland has any integrity whatsoever, he would resign in protest. Um... Uh, anyway, this is all just speculation because I have absolutely no idea what the hell is going on there. But I am just as frustrated as many of you. And for any of those in the audience, eh, no, nah, I'm not going to go there. I've already, I've already spoken long enough today on this. So anyways, that's it. That's it for, for today. I got to, I got to run here. But um, I thank you all for listening. And if you haven't done so already, please go over to YouTube and subscribe to my channel over there. Just look for Mark Romano Declaring Liberty Podcast and subscribe and turn on notifications um, because I, I put videos up on my YouTube channel more often than I do you know, full episodes of this podcast. So if you're not also subscribed on YouTube, and many of you may be listening to this on YouTube, but if you're listening to this on a podcast app, you know, you know Apple Podcasts or Google or Stitcher or whatever, any of the myriad podcast apps out there. If you're listening on one of those platforms uh, and you don't also follow me on YouTube, you're missing a lot of content. So pl I'll put a link in the show notes below to my YouTube channel. Please go over there, subscribe, hit the little bell to turn on notifications so you're notified anytime I post a new video. So that's it for now. 
Thanks, as always, for listening, and I'll talk to you again soon.